Hi, and welcome to this, the third episode in our five-part series on exploring quantum computing. In the first episode, we had a quick tour of what is quantum computing and how is it similar to uh, other forms of computation that we may be more familiar with. In episode two, we looked at the logic puzzle that we're going to use as a framework for trying to understand how we can use quantum computing. And in this episode, episode three, we're going to explore actually coding up the puzzle. So looking at how do we take that representation that we described in the previous episode and turn it into code. So as I said at the very start, we're using a platform called uh, Jupyter, and we're going to use a, a, developed, a MasterCard developed library called DiffQ. We're also using a quantum device called D-Wave, which is one of the commercial providers of quantum computing uh, technology. So uh, underlying all of this will be D-Wave's uh, platform. Okay, so let's get started. Let me start by uh, just uh, importing some, uh, some prerequisites, some libraries. Uh, but the key thing is let's start now building up our representation of the problem that we talked about in the previous episode. So the first thing that we're going to do here is to turn our uh, various names of our children, of our t-shirts, etc., colors into, uh, into numbers. So our children are going to be numbered 0 through 4, and likewise our five colors 0 through 4. And then we're also going to label the axes of that 5x5x5 five by five by five array or 5x5x5 five by five by five tensor that we talked about. Uh, one for uh, zero for, ch for the child, one for the color of the t-shirt, and two for the balloon. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, now we're going to uh, build up our array. And from here now we need to start to uh, express our constraints. So these are essentially the, the rules or the puzzle, the puzzle clues that we have to work with that are going to define what constitutes a potentially valid solution versus an invalid one. So we're going to start by uh, implementing our global constraints. So these are uh, going to be expressed as sums across the various slices of our tensor or of our array that we're interested in. So for example, the first constraint that we're interested in is the idea that any single uh, combination of a child, a t-shirt, and a, a color can only have one uh, allocation in that. So for example, let's look at uh, our diagram here. What we can see here on the left is uh, that we have given the allocation that we've seen before. So child Dan has t-shirt orange and uh, uh, the yellow balloon. Um, and you can see when we sum across all of these entries in this particular slice of the array, they sum to one. So that is a potentially valid solution. We see on the right hand here, we have, uh, we have uh, a sum that comes to two. And here we have child Carol has been allocated the red t-shirt and the yellow balloon. And Dan has been allocated the orange t-shirt, but also the yellow balloon. So we know that this is going to be invalid because essentially the same balloon has been allocated to two different children. Uh, and we can know this is invalid because our sum here is two. So essentially what we want to do is to build a series of constraints looking across different slices of our tensor and ensuring that these sums always come to one. Okay, so that's the kind of the intuition. Let's look at how we're going to do that in code. So let me go ahead and run that and then we'll look at this briefly. So here we're going to use our diffq library and we're, we have a, um, a, a function call or a method call called join constraints. So here we're going to build up a range of constraints over time uh, until we have the entire problem expressed. <clears throat> and the key thing is this uh, sum equals one um, function that we're a constraint that we're going to use. And we're applying that across the different slices of the tensor and one for each child. So that's kind of what's going on here. We're essentially building up a, a range of these rules uh, or these constraints to ensure that the, the rule that we want to enforce, which is that each uh, combination of children, balloon, and, uh, uh, and t-shirt is unique, that's essentially what this piece of code is doing for us. Okay, and if you recall back from the original setup, we also have another constraint. That constraint tells us that the color of a child's t-shirt can't be the same as a child's balloon. Every child took a different color balloon to the t-shirt that they were wearing. So this is, uh, needs to be expressed somewhat differently. Essentially, we need to look at diagonal slices across our tensor uh, and to express the, the constraint that the sum of 
the balloons and the uh, t-shirts must be zero and that's what these couple of lines of code are doing for us. So that's our global constraints set up. Now we need to look at what we call our local constraints. So these are individual constraints that relate to the specific clues that we were given in the puzzle. So we'll look at the first one or two in a bit of detail and then we'll skip through some of the others because there are a lot of similarities. Okay, so in the first uh, puzzle clue that we're given or the first constraint it says that Adam took the yellow balloon. Now we don't yet know from this clue what color t-shirt Adam wore but we do know he, he took the yellow balloon. So if we look at another even smaller slice of our diagram here or of our uh, array we can see that uh, what we want to be able to express is that for child Adam A uh, that somewhere along the yellow balloon somewhere along that slice that must sum to one. We don't yet know which t-shirt he's wearing, but we do know that there must be a one in this, uh, in this column and, a, and by extension a zero everywhere else. So essentially you want to enforce the constraint that this little column of numbers here is going to be uh, going to sum to one. So let's look at how we do that in code. Uh, and again, it's not dissimilar to the previous constraints that we've seen. So we're going to join constraints again, so we're building up these constraints over time. We're saying sum equals to one, and then the slice of our tensor, where we're indexing it by child Adam and by balloon yellow, that must sum to one. So we're going to go ahead and add that to our set of constraints. The next few are quite similar, so Carl's balloon was yellow. So again, we can see we're using an almost identical expression, uh, but index here, we're indexing on uh, child uh, Carol and on balloon red so let's go ahead and do that Emma loves her orange balloon similar let's go ahead and do that and then the next puzzle clue we have is the green balloon was taken by Dan and is the same color as Adam's t-shirt so we can see there's actually two constraints here one is that Dan has the green balloon and the second one is that Adam's t-shirt is green uh, but we can express those constraints using the same formulism that we've used before so let's go ahead and, and do that Okay, this next one is a little bit more complex. So the child wearing the yellow t-shirt owns a balloon which is the same color as Beth's t-shirt. <clears throat> okay, so at, to start with, this tells us that Beth's t-shirt, cannot, Beth cannot be wearing the yellow t-shirt. But we also need uh, a slightly different, uh, more complex way to, uh, to be able to express the full nature of this uh, constraint. Essentially that uh, there is a child wearing a yellow t-shirt um, it's clearly not going to be Beth. So the, the, the set of code to, to do that is a little bit more complex. I'm not going to walk through it all just in the interest of time, but essentially this is how we go ahead and set up that constraint. The next piece here, Carol's, uh, Carol's pink t-shirt has a bow on it. Now the fact that it has a bow is irrelevant. Really this clue is telling us that Carol has a pink t-shirt. So again, we can express that using some of the simpler uh, formalisms that we've used already. Okay, so that is our problem set up now. We've worked through all of the constraints, both the global constraints and the local constraints, and we're now ready to actually do this on a quantum computer. Everything up to now is just running locally on my laptop. There's no quantum happening anywhere. But now we're finally ready to start to uh, get this problem ready for a quantum computer. So please join me in the next episode where we'll finalize the preparation of the problem, submit it to a quantum computer, and then ultimately take a look at the results. So I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.